Uh, yeah, I'm from the State Library of Queensland and I'm currently the coordinator of Public Library Services. So I'm going to talk about our Looking at 2.0 program today. Um, but first of all, I think I'd like to know who is in the audience. Um, so first of all, hands up who is an instructional designer in the audience? So about 60%. Um, hands up who is an administrator? Doubling up. Uh, hands up who is a developer. I can see someone I know is a developer is not putting his hands up. <laughs> uh, hands up who's a librarian. All right, <laughs> all alone as usual. Um, so our Looking at 2.0 course is a free online course for the general public. Um, it was developed back in 2010 and we had a first iteration which was very uh, text-based. Um, I've got slides a little bit later, but the original purpose of the Looking at 2.0 program was to, um, well, for us, it was to increase access to library services because we have a network of public library services throughout Queensland. And if you think about the geographical area of Queensland, you've got, um, well, Victoria can actually fit into Queensland about five or six times, I think. So our population is very dispersed across in really interesting um, geographical areas and every time I go out and visit some of them I usually have to pack for a variety of different weather situations so it could be raining or it could be you know 42 degrees and yeah so they face a lot of challenges too um, so we needed to develop a course that was accessible by pretty much anyone and it's not facilitated at all so we needed to create something that uh, maybe had the look and feel of a website when you first got onto it, uh, but it would take you through the basics of learning without you actually knowing it. Uh, it's kind of like the duck analogy. You've got the duck on the top of the water all smooth and then underneath his legs are doing this, which is pretty much what we're doing back at um, State Library of Queensland underneath the course. We're doing all the stats collection. We're trying to analyse based on um, the information that we collect from people doing the courses, even though we don't actually have any interaction with them. Uh, so primarily that's why we chose to use Moodle in the first place back in 2010. Um, that was before I joined with the State Library so I don't have a lot of information about that program but ooh, but um, I do have a lot of interaction with the audience itself so coming from a public library background or I think about 10-15 years ago I first started as a public librarian I had a lot of know-how in um, how the eventual users would interact with the system. So I'm not an instructional designer, I'm not a developer. For all of the iterations of looking at 2.0, we've hired people in to do that for us, um, both of which are currently in the room, and they were both excellent, like really awesome. Not just saying that because they're here, they actually did a lot of work with us in the background to help us achieve those goals of making the system not feel like it was learning. Um, I don't know if you realise, but um, the federal government guesstimates that about 50% of the Australian population is digital, di digitally illiterate. So the kinds of people that public librarians have to deal with when they come into the library to do a course like this is someone who's never touched a mouse, someone who has no idea what Facebook is. Um, and I think for some people like us, uh, that's a hard concept to actually understand what that means for people's lives. So they can't do online banking, they can't book holidays online. Um, some of them wouldn't even have an email address yet. <laughs> and a part of when we were developing the site was realising that people wouldn't have had any interactions with online courses before. They, they wouldn't actually have an email address. So that was one of the first things that you have to do to actually get into the um, course we got a little side video which will teach you how to set up your own email address to be able to log into the Looking at 2.0. Um, so as you can see from the screens, the, the typical audiences were seniors, um, rural and remote, and funnily enough, educators who had to deal with this uh, stakeholder group who didn't have any digital skills, but they need to give them the basics before they can move on to the actual um, courses that they need to do with the educators. And quite a lot of adults who are um, upskilling as well. So people who are returning to the wor workforce, people who've been working in uh, manual labour jobs and that need to, because they're getting too old to do them now, they need to move into something which is a bit um, less physical. 
so we found that a lot of these kinds of people were coming to do the course as well. So obviously, why would we pick Moodle? Um, well, because it's open source, the State Library of Queensland, um, we're not a government department, we're a statutory authority, so we operate under slightly different rules. Um, we don't get a lot of funding. <laughs> so third point, it's free. That was the, one of the biggest selling points when we were trying to get the project off the ground. Um, instead of using something like WordPress or a, just a general um, website, we wanted something that would give us all that background underneath data that we needed to be able to improve the courses and to um, work with the public librarians who could possibly be helping people out in the communities as well. So it's scalable. We started off with uh, a first iteration, which I think looks like that. So that was our first iteration of looking at 2.0. Um, as you can see, it's really text heavy. Uh, but it, we did run a lot of competitions with it as well because we got, it's non-facilitated. We don't know who we're dealing with out in the public. Uh, we had to give them some kind of incentive. So we gave away free iPads. <laughs> so if they completed the course, they would be entered automatically into a competition. Um, and at the end of a particular phase of time, we would give out the free iPad to um, just a randomly selected participant. So moving from that, we went to that. Um, and this was actually brilliant. Uh, a lot of the feedback we had from the earlier iteration was it's too text heavy. Um, the, my screens are too small. I can't open it on a mood on an iPad. Um, so we went with a really simplified version of what was already there. So it's not really new content. It's just been tweaked a little bit here and there to update it for you know as technology grows over about two years, I think. Uh, so this, as soon as you log in, it's immediately just visual. And that's how we worked through the majority of the rest of our courses as well. Uh, I won't, well, I don't think I can get into one right now, but actually any of you guys can sign up to get in to have a look at this. Uh, it's free, open to everyone. So if you want to have a look at what we did, um, just jump in and create yourself an account. Um, but this is a general indication of how the rest of the courses go as well. So we've got things like uh, searching the web, booking a holiday, um, learning online, using the cloud, those sorts of things. These are the topics that we're dealing with when we're working with people who are digital, digitally illiterate. I can never say that one. Um, yeah, so we basically had to keep it really basic. Um, so the challenges that we face with a course like this is, um, just skip to my notes. Don't have any notes on this one. I'll just add lib. <laughs> Privacy, because uh, it's not a traditional course, so we don't have the option of um, enrolling cohorts that we already know. We don't have their data, and technically we can't keep their data, uh, and we can't actually ask them to give us their data. So all we could get from them is um, an email address and possibly a name and a, a rough geological location. And that will tell us if they're in Queensland, whereabouts in Queensland they are, but it doesn't give us their actual address. Address? Address. Um, and there's statutory reasons why we're not allowed to collect that, um, which is a, I don't actually understand why, but because we're a statutory authority, I think. And we're dealing with expectations as well. So we don't know what people's expectations are when they get into a course like this. Uh, they could think it's just another website, um, which is what we actually worked towards making them think. And we're not sure what they want to get out of it. So who are they? Are they TAFE students? Are they um, someone's grandparents who've never touched a mouse? Um, so we had to cater for this huge group of people and we don't know what they want from us or from the course. And the other issue is copyright. <laughs> I won't go into my librarian spiel about copyright. You know it's good, right? <laughs> or bad, depending on which end you're coming from. Um, but with the State Library of Queensland, everything we create is under Creative Commons. So, and that's a license 2.0. So with this course, we had to A, create it under uh, Creative Commons 2.0, and every media aspect that we use inside it also has to be created under Creative Commons 2.0. So we had a lot of work trying to find things that were relevant to help people learn, um, which was freely available. So technically, everything in there 
is information and images and media that people can find for themselves. But we uh, have aggregated it all into the one place so that they don't have to. And that's actually um, one of the primary purposes of, of libraries anyway, is to draw everything in for you uh, so that you don't have to do it yourself. Um, just when I first graduated, I actually, people would say, what do you do? And I'd say, oh, I'm a knowledge detective. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now I just say, oh, I work for the government. <laughs> So the final issue that we had with this kind of course, because we don't have completion, well, we did have completion tracking on, and then we took it off, and then now we've turned it back on again. Um, so we don't really know where people jump out of their courses, um, if they're just going in and having a look, and then you know, going, oh, I don't want to look at this, this is not what I want. So we had to rely a lot on feedback. Actually, 100%, we had to rely on feedback. So the way we offer these particular courses is through our public libraries. So we did some training with the public library staff themselves and it was surprising how many people of the public library staff actually needed to do the courses themselves. So they didn't know what cloud-based computing was, they'd never booked a holiday online. So we had a fair amount of um, background training with the people who could possibly be delivering the courses but maybe not. Uh, but that was a good thing for us to learn as a, as a state library. Um, to figure out where the public libraries are themselves. So we learnt a lot through this process. And I probably didn't mention at the start, but um, this was a pilot project. And uh, while technically it's been going for about five or six years now, we're still calling it a pilot project because each time we uh, redevelop it, we're coming in with new statistics and new knowledge about the people that are using it. And I'll talk a little bit later about a new partnership that we're just about to wrap up uh, with new modules. Um, yeah, so <laughs> well, it probably all sounds a little bit vague, but um, it's the kind of situation that we work with, unfortunately. So I just popped in a map so that you can see the kinds of areas that we're working with. This is a um, location map of where the libraries are. Uh, and the libraries include Indigenous Knowledge Centres. So you'll see up at the top, we've got 16 which seem to be hovering off the coast. Uh, they are hovering off the coast. They're all on islands in the Torres Strait. So there's 16 Indigenous Knowledge Centres up there. Sorry, I'm just getting over cold. So uh, for the Indigenous Knowledge Centres themselves, uh, they're probably one of our primary core user groups for this um, course because the majority of their clients are second language users. So their first language is not English, possibly their second and third language isn't English either. And they have the most dreadful internet connection you can imagine. Um, I think for weeks at a time they don't even have the internet. So we, that was another thing we had to consider when we were developing the courses. If we need to print it off as a PDF and um, post it to them, <laughs> how much work is that going to make for us? So make them all interactive, but at the lowest level possible. So the benefits. Well, the benefits to us have actually been pretty big. Um, you can see we've had participation from about half of the public libraries around Queensland. Um, and by that I mean participation as in they chose to deliver these courses as a program through their library where they would get people in uh, and run it like a normal class. So about half of them across Queensland um, participated that way voluntarily, which was great once they'd had the training and realised how cool it was. And there's a wide dispersal of users so we had, I think in the first three months, about 6,000 Queensland users enrol, and that's just members of the public finding it by accident. Um, and that, that didn't include the statistics from the public library um, classes that were run, so that's additional. I'm not a statistics person, so I didn't put any up. <laughs> um, so we had interstate users as well, uh, which wasn't a huge number but it's uh, started to slowly grow as the project became more well known across, because we would talk about it to other state libraries, of course. And we even had some internationals. Um, so people who randomly found it on the internet, I think that might be due to our ICT department being really good at Google search, <laughs> putting in all the metadata. Um, but yeah, so we were quite p pleased and surprised by the diversity of um, countries that, well, 
say that in a different way. We were surprised by where people enrolled from and how they found them, especially because it's an English language course and we had people enrolling from Abu Dhabi, um, some people in the States, we had uh, people from India, people from the UK, people from Paris, I think we had someone from Norway. And we also had one guy who was working on one of the science research stations on an island, you know, somewhere down near Antarctica. Um, and we thought that he was some kind of bot. <laughs> so we actually sent him an email and said, hey, are you real? He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm totally real. I just don't know anything about cloud computing. So he jumped on and did the course, which was great. And he actually gave us some really good feedback coming from a science perspective and someone who actually hadn't had any human contact for about three months. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he actually gave us a call by satellite phone and it was terrible. Yeah, but he gave some really great feedback. So, I think I'm really ahead of time, aren't I? Oh, that's great. Questions are good. <laughs> um, well, I'll tell you about the future. Uh, I think if I go back to this one, so it's pretty exciting. Um, we've been working in partnership with Tate Queensland. They saw the site and decided this, this kind of presentation would be perfect for their um, low literacy learners. So they have courses that they run with, um, I think they're about level three language skills. I'm not sure if anyone here knows what that means. Just some nods and some yeses. Uh, so they could be um, recent migrants, they could be people who are upskilling from having a, um, a manual job uh, that they've had all their life and they haven't had to change jobs before. Uh, they could be people who are actually have really low literacy even though they are Australian born. Um, so they wanted to create a set of four modules around job searching. And they created the content for us, which was great. Uh, and they had to do a lot of adjustment because previously they haven't delivered courses online through this kind of um, interface. So it was a real learning experience for them too. But we had, um, we had a lot of trial and error. Uh, we had a great developer who um, came up with some really great ideas for how to present content with, um, with that kind of audience. So there's a lot of things you need to consider when you're working with people with low literacy skills because they might also have low digital literacy skills. But for them, the majority of them are actually going to have a facilitator so they'll be doing it in class. And the benefit to us then comes because they'll know the interface and then they'll be able to go and do the other three <laughs> sets of <laughs> courses. So uh, we're getting a ready-made um, additional stakeholder group, which was great. So. One point I probably forgot to mention was that this particular course was, I'm just gonna blow our own horn here, the first publicly available digital literacy course in Australia. Um, you're supposed to clap then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And considering our statistics, I think we did pretty well. Um, so, if anyone has any questions, you should probably ask them now. Thank you. Um, you said it's you have international learners at the moment, mm -hmm. um, but is it very contextual to Australian audiences? Like, do we use it or recommend this for some of our internationally um, based participants on our course? Do we require this sort of basic introductory learning? We try to stay away from contextualising it specifically to a Queensland or Australian group, so you're free to use it with whoever you want if you think it's relevant. Um, as I said, everything's under Creative Commons, so yeah, use it, please, please do. Um, steal it, you know, redesign it in your own way, that's fine. We love it when people do that. Yep. Oh, you mentioned that you uh, weren't sure about who your audience were and, and what they wanted, um, and that you were flying blind a little bit. Have you since, or and you weren't sure where they engaged with the course, have you since discovered the Moodle reports and do you then, are you now able to look at where students or where people are jumping in and jumping out? Yeah, we did uh, start using the Moodle reports. Unfortunately, the first two or three months we had an issue with our server wasn't allowing the reports to be run. Um, I think that's because we're hosting it ourselves in our cloud. We have our own cloud servers. Um, they just weren't talking to each other. 
yeah. So we had to guesstimate for the first three months after the launch of the site about who they were and what they were doing. Um, but we did a lot of talking to different people. And then when we got the reports, we were able to, you know, refine what we thought about them as well. Um, you talked about the different groups that you had. Were you finding you were getting different feedback from each of those stakeholders groups or were you getting the same types of feedback? The same type of feedback? Look and feel and what yeah. you're getting out of it. And yep. groups, the groups. Well, anytime you have voluntary feedback, you're always going to get 60% of people saying, it's great, I love it and then nothing else after that. So you have to keep questioning people on and on and on. So once we got our hooks into a particular group of people, then we would just keep coming back and saying, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? Do you like that? Did that work? So we had to work quite hard for our feedback as well. Um, but luckily we had the public libraries who were able to do that for us with their community too. But overall, um, there was a lot of feedback which was similar. So it pointed out a few things that we had to change, which we, we did pretty easily. And uh, I'm just waiting for the new modules to come out and we'll start getting feedback of a different kind, which will be good. Yep. Um, I've just actually got in, so I'm looking at it now. But it's a question. With each of them, we've got beginners, in intermediate and advanced. So when a learner is going through it, do they get something to test their knowledge? Or have you got anything built in there to, to do that so they get a no, there's no quizzes or anything included. We did have those in the first iteration. Um, and the feedback that we got from that is that not many people actually did it voluntarily. And those that did said, oh, what was the point of that? So it, it's quite different th working with this group than it is working with students who have that kind of um, compliance attitude. They're like, I, I know I need to do this and I need to do this well. Uh, because a lot of the people we work with for this is seniors or um, adults returning to the workforce. They were like, well, I don't, I'm not going to do your quiz. But we are looking towards that um, in the future iterations. Yeah. It'd yeah. be nice to, to get something at the end, a certificate or something to say they've done the beginners. <coughs> yep, yep. We had that with, with the original one and we turned it off for this one based on some of the feedback that we got. But with the partnership with TAFE, uh, there's some compliance involved around that. And for future iterations, we're looking at gradually introducing it in different ways and how to do it in a, an inconspicuous way. Mm. So at the moment, doing it through the TAFE, so are you putting through students at low levels through this? They will be. They will be. Yep. Yeah. We're hosting it. We, we developed it and we'll host it on our site and they so will take them through yeah. as part of their classes, yeah. specific groups. See how it goes. Thank you very much. Everyone, please.